So okay, uh, we'll start. Uh, how's how's your progress with the assignments assignment going? Uh, okay. Okay. So if you have no questions, uh, I mean the later part of the assignment is about sampling, so which was uh, covered in the last lecture. Uh, learning of graphical models is today's lecture, but there's no question in the assignment about that. Yeah, you have a question? I'm in the seventh question, it's sampling. Yeah. That's a coding question, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, because it's not there. I mean, how would you sample? I mean, so it's asking to get the samples and then get the average, right? So yeah, it's a, it's a yeah, you need to implement it in Python, maybe. Or, uh, yeah. OK, so that's good. So your project, uh, hopefully, some of the teams have already spoken to me. Uh, uh, try to not be too ambitious. So it's better to have uh, something complete and you know something that, uh, that you can talk about than incomplete work. So uh, those who have not yet spoken to me, uh, try to at least drop an email uh, about what you're doing, okay? so that you don't do it in the last two, last couple of days. Okay. Um, OK, so today we're going to look at, uh, uh, so this is the last lecture for graphical models. OK, so today we're going to look at uh, uh, getting the parameters of a graphical model. So you know the, the numbers inside these conditional probability uh, factors, these factors are potentials, right? Uh, where do you get those numbers from? I mean, of course, you get it from data. So this encompasses both supervised and unsupervised learning. So you've seen examples of uh, graphical models which are supervised, some examples which are unsupervised. So you can uh, learn both. You know, you can do both supervised and unsupervised learning using you know the estimation techniques that we're going to talk to talk about today. Okay. And uh, so the first thing is you know how do you learn parameters? So we'll go through a few simple examples, and uh, and then we'll directly jump to point four. We'll look at a few applications. You know, revisit the applications that we've already seen before actually. Uh, like uh, LDA and uh, uh, conditional random fields, we'll kind of revisit them, okay? And uh, then we'll look at uh, maximum likelihood estimation, which is a fairly intuitive, uh, but an overarching technique. You know, even if you don't know specific techniques to do estimation, maximum likelihood estimation is uh, is a good uh, hammer to know, uh, like how to use it. Uh, and then uh, we'll look at EM. So EM stands for expectation maximization. It's a Again, an algorithm to maximize the uh, observed likelihood. Uh, okay, uh, but it works in the settings where some of the random variables are not observed. Okay, uh, so we'll discuss about uh, when is EM applicable and uh, some details about it. There's also other methods to do estimation, uh, but we'll not go into uh, those details. Okay, uh, any questions about the lay of the land? Okay. So not that. Actually, oops. OK, so uh, just a recap. So why are we looking at graphical models? You know, I've, I've been repeating the slide for the third time now. Uh, it's basically, we've already seen methods to work with some unstructured data. At least uh, we've looked at how to work with uh, images. We've looked at how to work with text. Uh, audio signals are the same, although they, you know, in time dimension, they are, you know, uh, uh, they look like a bunch of measurements with just magnitudes that we can, you can translate them into frequency domain and thing, get things like spectrogram, which look like images. So you can actually just use uh, CNNs and uh, all those architectures that you've seen before uh, to work with audio as well. Okay. Uh, but uh, what we've not seen uh, before is uh, working with structured data where you have a lot of additional information. 
okay so when you have certain types of information you've already seen how to how to work with structured data uh, by which i mean uh, tabular data let's say uh, for tabular data you've already seen certain regularizations right you you, you do l2 regularization or uh, in lasso you add l1 penalty you know those are ways to impose uh, not metadata if not metadata some sort of domain knowledge or preference external preference which is not uh, driven by the data itself so there is external preference or metadata that you are adding to when when you are doing even lasso and ridge regression okay uh, but you know not all metadata is not like that you know and in the past couple of lectures uh, we've seen certain types of uh, i guess metadata uh, which is these dependencies across random variables so for you uh, the features the columns are now random variables and you're talking about how one random variable is related to the other okay and if you know some relationship like that uh, then uh, estimation sometimes becomes easy and uh, which we'll see today uh, inference also can become easy uh, which we saw last time okay uh, so uh, that's the that's the type of information that uh, graphical models encode uh, and uh, we've seen some applications uh, maybe not okay we have seen some applications uh, we have predominantly seen lda we'll revisit lda and uh, also had hmms and stuff like that okay so so that's today's lecture but in terms of the uh, the whole course uh, the first you know 6 7 lectures were about deep learning and we we also looked at graph convolutional networks which are also on uh, working on graphs right um, the next three lectures which was these this is the third third one of the next set uh, is about estimation in graphical models. It's general estimation technique, maximum likelihood estimation, stuff like that. Uh, next three lectures would be about uh, taking decisions. Okay, you don't want to just forecast and don't want to just uh, make good accuracy, uh, you know, good accurate predictions. Okay, you care about how well you did in terms of some actions that you took. Maybe you bet on the stock mar stock market in a certain way, or maybe you uh, source inventory in a certain way based on some forecasts. Hopefully, uh, it was not a suboptimal decision. If it was. Maybe in the next season or the next next month you do better. Okay, so there is this uh, decision making which is more important. Uh, I mean, which is the downstream, app, you know, it, it's a downstream uh, I guess object which consumes forecasts, right? So we also take that into account while learning. So uh, that's the next three lectures. Okay, from next le next lecture onwards. So any questions about that lay lay of the land of the whole course? Okay, uh, so that's where you'll see A/B testing all the way to reinforcement learning. Okay. Next, next three lectures. Uh, so, in terms of graphical models, we've seen these two uh, in the previous two lectures, uh, and today we look at uh, learning. And in fact, this, in some sense, this learning problem, uh, at least for the initial, you know, part of this lecture, will be somewhat easy. So, uh, let's see how it goes. Okay. Um, okay. So let's start with some applications. Um, in fact. In fact, we'll look at uh, four applications. Uh, the first one is uh, hidden Marco models. Uh, it's actually useful, very useful for time series analysis. Uh, so if you if you have time series data, you can always use a hidden Marco model to model it. Okay. Maybe the Marco assumption is wrong. Maybe the hidden assumption is wrong. So that there's always model misspecification issue with anything. Okay. So this kind of answers the question of which model is the best. There is no best model. If you misspecify the model, then you are going to be incorrect anyway. Um, so the next model is going to be Gaussian mixture models. It's actually useful for clustering. So uh, when you did clustering, you saw k-means and maybe some variations like k-medioids and stuff like that, or maybe even spectral clustering. Uh, so Gaussian mixture models can also be used as uh, tools for clustering your data. Okay. So um, of course, it makes assumptions about Gaussianity of data and so on. But uh, model of that, you can use that for clustering. So we'll see, uh, we'll see, we'll see a little bit more about Gaussian mixture models. So, how many of you have seen Gaussian mixture models before? So this was in 572, 575. Okay, yeah, I, I actually taught Gaussian mixture models, right? Okay, uh, for some some of the students. Um, okay. So, and the third third model will be uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. So, we have discussed what is meant by Dirichlet distribution before, in the context of uh, not just Dirichlet distribution, but whole the whole LDA model uh, model, I guess, description. Uh, when we're talking about natural language processing, okay, it's a very nice tool. You can just quickly get a corpus of documents, apply call LDA on your problem. It'll do uh, it'll do estimation. 
you know, it'll fit the parameters of the LDA model. And uh, then also give you, uh, once you fit the parameters, then you it'll give you some conditional probabilities, okay? So given the evidence, which is the documents, it'll tell you uh, the likelihood of, you know, uh, it can tell you the likelihood of a new new document, for example, belonging to some, some uh, topic class, okay? We'll discuss this. And the last one is conditional random fields. Uh, it's again, uh, particular version of a graphical model. It's useful for text, uh, uh, certain text tasks like uh, parts of speech tagging or uh, uh, tying together entities in a, in a, entities just means uh, things like places, names and so on. You can tag them in, in text sentences, okay? That's just one example, one or a couple of examples. There are many other uses of uh, conditional random fields, okay? Anyway, so we'll get into uh, those four applications pretty soon, but first let me start with a, actually a, a baby version of a hidden marker modeling, okay? So let's say, and this is just to motivate, we'll get back to hidden marker modeling in a few more slides. Uh, so let's say we have the following problem, which is, uh, you know, there's there, there are sensors, okay? Uh, which uh, report positions of, uh, of uh, let's say, a robot, okay? So the position, uh, the first, uh, and, and let's say this is discrete time, every second a position is reported in one dimension, let's say. Um, so the position of the robot is at uh, location zero, and then in the next couple of time periods, uh, it's at location two and two, okay? So that's the census measurements. And uh, and in this case, let's say you do, you know, you, okay, this additional information is not very critical, but let's say you have these sensor measurements, you have observed three entries, okay? You can think of those uh, three entries as uh, three observations, okay? O1, O2, and O3, okay? And uh, there's gonna be a position random variable corresponding to the position at, as, at each time. That's a random variable, okay? So X1, X2, and X3 are three random variables, okay? X2 depends on where the, where the robot was in the previous time period, and uh, X3, which is the position of the current, uh, you know, in the third time period, uh, it depends on where the robot was in the previous time period, okay? So there's a, a relationship between X1, X2, and X3. Those are the only three random variables. Those are not observed. What is observed is the center census readings, okay? And so since you have already observed the census readings, I have not represented the, them as uh, nodes, okay? Because they are not random anymore. Now, uh, here is a simple uh, graph, okay? Uh, this is a graph joining those three random variables. In fact, it's a factor graph. It's showing uh, what factors are uh, there. So it, there's a factor between X1 and X2, the factor between uh, X2 and X3. And uh, there, there are a couple of, uh, I guess these factor nodes dangling from each uh, each of the x1, x2, and x3 random variables, okay? Those are just think of as there is an F function on each of those factor nodes, okay? Um, and, uh, and so given these observations, you can infer, so you can find things like probability of, uh, you know, x3 given uh, observation one, observation two, and observation three. Okay, which are zero, zero comma two comma two. Okay, and maybe even if you know, maybe location of x, uh, you know, first uh, the actual location of the robot at uh, the first time period. Okay, so you can. So this is just an example to say you can have a graph like this, and we know if we have a graph like this, which is a tree graph, then we know how to even uh, do efficient inference on this. Okay, we can do message passing to find marginal distributions. And if you know marginal distributions and joint distributions, you can compute conditional distributions, right? Just base rule. Remember base rule is like a conditional probability is just a joint divided by uh, some sort of a marginal distribution, okay? So if I know how to compute marginals, if I know how, how to compute the joint, I can compute conditionals. Uh, so you can solve questions like this, like, uh, you know, this type of question uh, using uh, belief propagation, okay? Um, anyway, that was just a motivating example. So let's look at a different, uh, uh, a different graph. In this, in this, uh, it's just a, uh, in in this, in this, it's actually just a. There's no nothing hidden. Okay. In this case, I have a. Is this essentially called a random walk? Okay. A random walk just means uh, think of again a one dimension. You know, on the line. You know, okay. You have. Uh, uh, gradations, you know, the usual. So let's say you have, uh, so let's say you have a line and uh, you start from some point, let's say zero comma zero. Actually, this this is a different type of random walk. Um, okay, 
this one is this is a two dimensional random walk. Um, so you start from zero comma zero in this example, and then uh, every time period uh, you flip a coin, and uh, if the coin is heads, uh, you move to the left. Uh, so to the what is it? To the right. Okay. So maybe this way, and if it uh, lands tails, uh, you move down. Okay. That's it. So that's the random walk. Uh, there are different types of random walks. This is an example of a random walk. You're just saying that I start from zero comma zero, I flip a coin, heads or tails, or whatever two outcomes. Whichever outcome happens, I go to the to the right or I go down. Okay, and uh, and that's represented by and the location of the uh, of this random walking object uh, at any given uh, time period is uh, given by this uh, random variable x. You know, uh, we have shown five time periods, and uh, these random variables are related to each other through this uh, particular graph. Okay, this is now a DPGM, right? And uh, given this, uh, given this graphical model, you can, I mean, you can actually know what the what the factors are. The factors are the parent of the current node is just the previous node, uh, and the probability with which I'm going to transfer, or sorry, uh, the probability with which uh, xi is going to take some value. For example, if I'm at a certain location, let's say 0, 0, the probability with which I'll, I'll take this, I'll go right, is alpha. The probability with which I'll go down is uh, uh, 1 minus alpha. And uh, me going anywhere else is 0. Okay, So that completely specifies the transition probability. Okay. So that's the conditional probability of me going from given position to the right is something, down is something, everywhere else is zero. Okay. So that's described by, I mean, that's explicitly written here, but uh, that's um, that's what this is. Okay. Just an example of a graphical model, and what could you do with it? You can find, you know, what is the expected location of uh, this object after hundred rounds. Okay. After hundred rounds, you kind of expect that, you know, let's say alpha is one half. Then you expect that maybe half the time I went right and half the time I went down, so that means that uh, you know maybe my location is fifty comma fifty, okay, just uh, you know off the line off the cuff calculation. Um, so not just you know what is the expected location in after hundred rounds. You can ask a lot of other things like what is the probability with which it'll cross the it'll cross the like uh, maybe yeah maybe the cro cross the minus fifty axis okay. And so what is the probability with which it'll cross this uh, this level? Uh, things of that nature. Those are all probabilities. You can compute them uh, from this description, okay? From this graphical model. Any questions? Okay. Uh, so here's uh, another graph. I mean, just to kind of this is again motivation. It's a simple example. Uh, so, so there are two th two uh, I guess states. Either you have cold or you have allergies. Okay. That there are two symptoms that are observed: you're coughing, or you could have itchy eyes. Okay, two things that can be observed. Uh, we don't know what the actual state is, whether you have cough or allergies. Maybe there is a graph like this. Okay, allergies cause both coughing and uh, itchy eyes, whereas cold only causes um, coughing. Okay, so this is the graph, and the equivalent factor graph is here. Uh, then you can ask, what is the? I mean, given that I observed both coughing and uh, itchy eyes. Uh, what is the probability with which I have allergies, or what is the probability with which I have uh, coughing? Okay, uh, sorry, with uh, cold. Okay. I mean, here uh, the moment you write down this graph, and if you know the parameters, um, knowing the parameters is uh, most of the chunk of this lecture. If you know the parameters, you can just infer these things mechanically. Okay. I, I mean, here either you can use belief propagation or anything like that, uh, or sampling to figure this out, or you can just do it hand compute if you just have four nodes. But uh, that's the idea. Okay, and the same thing with now a couple of more nodes. If you know here, these are the states: pneumonia, cold, and malaria. And you have uh, things that you can be measured: fever, cough, and vomit. And uh, and given that you you know the patient has cough and fever, uh, what disease that do they have? You can actually, if you know this relationship, that pneumonia causes these things, cold causes these things, uh, and so on. If you have this relationship, so which means that you somehow historically had data from which you could infer this graph or domain knowledge based you could get this graph 
uh, and somehow using data you could find the uh, parameters of this joint distribution okay uh, then you can find this condition probability it's just asking what is the probability of a uh, certain you know maybe what pneumonia being true uh, given uh, you know cough and fever right something being true right this um, i guess uh, uh, but the f so a description of the same thing is that first you start with a disease you generate a disease uh, you have choice three choices uh, um, sorry you generate a disease for each disease okay there are three diseases here pneumonia cold and malaria you flip a coin for each one of them with some bias and turn either pneumonia on or off you turn uh, cold on or off and you turn malaria on or off okay so in this example it's pneumonia is true cold is false uh, malaria is false once you have those states fixed then you can find the symptoms the uh, symptoms depend on what were the realizations of these uh, three diseases, uh, three states before? Okay, so you can say what is the probability of fever given pneumonia was one, cold was zero, uh, malaria was zero. So that that's the way you can generate data from this. Okay, that's a this is that's this is a generative description or a, I guess this is a generative description of this uh, process. Okay, first you generate the states of the diseases whether they are on or off, and then you generate the um, symptoms themselves. Okay, using the conditional probabilities. So that's why there's a there's a director graph, director probability graphical model. Um, parents of fever are the only ones which influence what fever takes, you know, true or false. Okay. Any questions? Okay. These are all just warm ups. Uh, so now we're going to start with those four applications that I was talking about. So we're going to spend a minute or two more on hidden marker model and then go to LDA, GMM, uh, GMM, and then LDA. Um, okay. So what is. Uh, so what is a hidden marker model? A hidden marker model is essentially uh, this type of a graph. Okay, so you have a sequence of hidden nodes, or first you put some nodes at that one layer. Uh, I guess not one layer, but at the top. Okay, connect them in one direction. So there's a bunch of edges going in this direction. Okay, uh, H kind of indicates that there's a hidden in the sense you don't get to observe or make measurements of these random variables. You don't see the outcome, so they are not flipped ever. Okay, you don't you don't see them. Uh, and then uh, this particular model has uh, downward edges from each of the hidden nodes uh, to a node which is observed. Okay, so this E is just evidence. Okay, so uh, for each hidden node, there is an evidence node. It's like the measurement of uh, a state. Okay, so where the robot is in some location, but the sensor is telling me something. So you only observe what the sensor is telling you. The sensor could be faulty, right? It's uh, with some probability it may be like. Uh, it may be telling you that you are two centimeters to the right, whereas you are not. Okay, so uh, so that's that randomness is captured in this uh, sensor measurement uh, random variable or these is observed random variables. Okay, and uh, and the key things are going to be these transition probabilities and these uh, what are called emission probabilities or observation probabilities. So the so what's the parent of uh, H four? H 4s parent is just one H three. So you only need to know that factor, probability of H4 given H3. Similarly, you only need to know the factor H3 given H2, right? Uh, similarly, for what's the parent for uh, an observed random variable E4? It's only uh, H4, right? So you only need to know that conditional probability. Okay, if you know these conditional probabilities, you can you know the whole joint distribution, and then you can compute all sorts of things, marginals, conditionals, right? So what is the generated description? It's obvious. So you start with. Uh, you know, you keep generating the hidden variables, right? Given previous one, generate the next one. Okay, uh, it's Marco because uh, this type of a relationship where HT only depends on the immediate previous random variable and not everything else, not HT minus two, HT minus three is is called Marco dependency. Okay, uh, it doesn't have to be just HT given HT minus one. It could be HT given HT minus one, HT minus two, but some limited number of previous random variables. It doesn't have to be just the previous one. It could be previous two. But not nothing beyond that. For example, okay. So that's called a Marco uh, uh, property. Uh, you can generate these guys, and uh, yeah, and and then you can generate the observations once you know these uh, hidden variables. Okay, that's a generated description. Uh, so so here is the joint distribution explicitly. It's just a product of these uh, conditional probabilities, the two conditional probabilities. How the how the hidden states trans transition from one to the other, and how what is emitted, what is observed actually through the sensors. Okay. Um, 
that's a joint distribution. And then there are some couple of, uh, I guess, well-known queries or well-known problems that people solve. Okay, so when people use hidden Markov models in uh, uh, object tracking problems in uh, engineering, okay, maybe missile tracking or things of that nature, uh, uh, location of robots and and so on. Uh, there are well, these are well-known problems that people solve, which are a couple of problems are listed here. Uh, one is called filtering, and the other one is called smoothing. Okay, uh, just to, just to give you an example of what what are problems people stand you know in standard uh, ways solve. Okay, filtering is just uh, nothing but uh, given some number of observations. In this case, given observations observed so far, tell me what the uh, uh, what the hidden state is. Okay, so hidden states are never measured. Okay, I don't know where the robot actually is, but given all my observations, sensor reading so far, what is my most likely idea of where the robot is? Okay, that's uh, that's called filtering, where you're using the uh, you're using the information. Okay, so in terms of like generation, first I would have generated the hidden random variable and then got an E3. But here I'm saying I, I know E3. Just tell me where you know kind of filter out or clean up or some sort of process where I am located. Okay. Uh, that's why it's called filtering, and smoothing is just an extension of it, where I use the not just the not just the up to this time, I use the whole uh, whole observed sequence. Okay, it's non-causal in in a sense. Uh, is the right word? Yeah, non-causal because I'm uh, I want to filter figure out the state at a given time, but I'm using the information in the future. Okay, uh, that's all. That's called smoothing. Uh, but then there's the usual operations, right? You can find okay. Let's say you observe e1 to e5. You can ask. Uh, what would be the? You can ask uh, what would be h6. Okay, you can ask you can ask such uh, such questions as well. That would be forecasting problem. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this slide is just saying that uh, the the uh, in this joint distribution actually, you know, probability of h i given h i minus one. There's going to be one parameter. And probability of emission given uh, HI, there's going to be another parameter. So these two probabilities, these are conditional probabilities, they're going to be the same. Okay, so there's going to be one object for the transition, one object for the conditional probability, and they're not indexed by time, as in they're not changing. Uh, so this conditional probability is relating HI and HI minus one, right? So two random variables. So there's another conditional probability which is relating two other random variables. Let's say HI and HI plus one. Ideally, I mean, in the original in, in you know normally you would have two tables with two you know two sets of numbers representing these conditional probabilities. Let's say, but instead of that, we'll only have one table. Okay, it's it's a it's the same conditional probability table being used by many random variables. Okay, it means that uh, all these random variables share these parameters. Okay, same thing with emission. Okay, so for example, think of uh, this emission as being a Gaussian random variable. So maybe with mean uh, zero and variance one. Then all these other guys, conditionally Gaussian, let's say, given so sorry, conditionally Gaussian, let's say the conditional part is uh, you know depends on h, okay. So given h, okay, what am I saying? Uh, probability of emission given uh, h is equal to h, let's say is uh, normally distributed with mean h and variance one, okay. So this is uh, so this is p emit, okay, p emit. Uh, so this is a, an example of a, a conditional distribution where it only depends on uh, so the you know the parameters don't change with respect to time. Okay, this like the only parameter which is not h is uh, one. Okay, uh, one doesn't change with time. Okay. If it was changing with time, then that would be not that would not be parameter sharing. Okay, and. Uh, And uh, later on, so okay, so we'll look at maybe variations of this while learning. So what we'll learn is actually things like uh, you know this number one. Okay, how did we get this number one? Uh, we'll have to do maximum likelihood estimation. So the learning problem is to learn the parameters, maybe theta one, maybe theta two, two sets of parameters. Maybe the transition probability is given by a table, like uh, some sort of table. Then I have to figure out those numbers. Okay, I'll figure out those numbers using data. Similarly, I'll figure out the emission probability. In this case, maybe there's a, instead of one, there's a sigma there. I need to find a sigma hat. You know, I need to find that sigma from data. Okay, that's a learning problem. Uh, any questions about HMM in terms of structure and what you can do with it? I mean, it it was used. 
uh, you can still use it. It it is it was an integral component of uh, uh, automatic speech recognition uh, systems. And these days, uh, you can do other architectures. You saw deep deep architectures can can do uh, speech recognition. So uh, large vocabulary, real time real speech speech recognition can be accomplished using deep networks directly. But previously, people people were using hidden Markov models and Gaussian mixture models to kind of Ha to build a system which would do this recognition. Okay. Previously, as in ten, you know, maybe eight years ago, ten years ago. Um, okay. So, if no questions about hidden Markov models, let's look at uh, um, Gaussian mixture models or mixture models in general. So, what is the motivation for mixture models? Okay. Uh, we saw we I, at the beginning. I said that mixture model, in for, in, in fact. Gaussian mixture models can be used for clustering. Okay, that's fine. But even before that, why why mixtures, right? So first of all, standard distributions like simple Gaussians or gamma distribution or beta distribution, things of that nature, uh, they are pretty simple. Okay, they will they may be just be unimodal. Okay, they may not have uh, they may not be able to capture two peaks, for example. Okay, very bad fit for such data. Okay, so uh, to represent uh, uh, co more complex histograms, for example, just a histogram which has things like this. Okay, uh, This doesn't look like a Gaussian, uh, it doesn't look like it can be fit by Gaussian. So you can, uh, the idea is to compose simple distributions, Okay, compose as in build on top of simple distributions. And that's the idea of a mixture, uh, which is that uh, you can mix standard distributions by saying that, OK, this is like some sort of a mix of uh, two Gaussians, Okay, something like this. And there's a precise definition I'll go in the next slide, but that's the idea of uh, creating mixtures of uh, distributions. Okay, just to kind of uh, express, uh, have a bigger class of distributions, parametric distributions, which can express data. Okay, um, and and Gaussian mixture models can be used for clustering. So we'll get there. Uh, so let's see. Yeah. So this is just the definition of a n-dimensional n-dimensional Gaussian distribution. Okay, um, so let's say we have k, k, you know, k mixture components, which means that I'll try to mix k Gaussians, and each Gaussian will have its own mean vector and uh, covariance covariance matrix. Okay, uh, to describe the mixture model, I I need the components, of course, Gaussians, and therefore I need to know the means and the covariances. But I also need to know these uh, mixture proportions, okay? And the mixture proportions are uh, essentially numbers for each mixture component. They sum to one, okay? It's basically a um, yeah, it's it's a basically a probability mass function, okay? So this theta is a, a probability mass function. They sum to one, but the, each theta i from i i is equal to one to k is a number between 0 to 1, they sum to 1, okay? Mixture proportions, okay? And so what is the generative description of a, uh, of a getting data from a mixture model, given this these, these, these guys? Mu, sigma, and theta are going to be the parameters, okay? Uh, the generative description is first you sample which mixture component I will get the data from, okay? This is just a, a way to describe the data. The data may not be the, like this, okay? But this is a generative way to describe how the, the data might have been generated. First, you sample which mixture component you get from. Uh, you would want to get the data from. That's that's given by y. So this is just a probability mass function. So you get one of the components, uh, and once you know the component, you sample an x from that component. Okay, and then you get the p of uh, y comma x. Then what you do is you ignore, as in uh, forget the y's. You just remember the x's, and the x's are your data. Okay, so that's how you and uh, x's were what were observed for you. You know, maybe in tables or something like that. Is the generative description of a mixture model clear? Of a, of this Gaussian mixture model clear? Any questions? Okay, so how many of you? So you've already seen Gaussian mixture models, but have you seen how to estimate the parameters of a Gaussian mixture model? Yes. You're not sure. You don't remember. Uh, so did they did uh, did the instructor cover uh, expectation maximization? Okay. Okay, so you know how to do it, but we'll revisit it. Okay. Um, so here's just an example uh, in one dimensions. You know the mixture. That I, I was drawing the histogram, but this is the so this this curve here 
is actually the p of x okay so p of x just means you marginalize over uh, y so this is just nothing but sum over y of p of uh, y comma x where p of y comma x was defined in the previous slide okay right p of y comma x was first you sample p of x given y times p of y and we know what p of y was p of y was just a uh, pick one of the components just a simple pmf and p of x given y was a normally distributed random variable with means and covariances depending on the y the component okay so we know this we need to marginalize over y that's this blue curve okay the blue curve is what is being uh, modeled here uh, similarly for i guess uh, mix in a, in a two dimension it's a different data set two dimensional data set uh, you could have uh, two gaussians you know two gaussians uh, like this okay okay so so we'll we'll revisit actually em again uh, in a few slides uh, independent of i guess gaussian mixture models uh, but now we are trying to figure out how to so gmms there is really i mean uh, the graphical model is very simple right so you just sample y so you have a y and uh, it gives an x okay that's it there are two two things p of x and y so this is a joint distribution the square thing okay and you just have two things i mean of course uh, x is a vector but uh, let's not worry about it and uh, graph graph is just a, a directed graph with two nodes y and x okay so it's a simple graphical model right just two nodes now what we are trying to do is estimate the parameters of this guy so the, uh, the parameters are uh, mu sigma k mu k sigma k and theta okay so those are the parameters of this model and we're going to try to estimate it and uh, one of the ways to estimate it it is is using uh, what is called uh, the em algorithm okay uh, why are we doing em okay so why are we doing em so for that let's look at the probability of uh, x and y okay it's it was just the uh, so what is the yeah okay let me actually write it uh, so x is equal to little x uh, and uh, y is equal to little y uh, is a is the probability of uh, so little x given y is equal to little y times probability of uh, y is equal to little y okay now this is just simple right so now uh, what i want to do is uh, write this as a product okay what is the product uh, it's going to be uh, product over y is equal to 1 to k So probability over x is equal to x given y is equal to 1 um, times um, probability of y is equal to 1 Okay, I mean, I don't know if this is the right reduction, but let's see. Uh, this is an indicator of y is equal to, uh, okay. And this is a summation. So let's let's call it x i y i for a specific for specific observation. Let's say you could observe the uh, component choice, which is y i. That's not part of the data. Okay, generally the mixture data that we saw in the one dimension, two dimension, there's no yi is in the data okay there was just a mixture of two gaussians uh, that we saw um, okay so we can write it this way why is that because only one of these terms is going to be valid right uh, so this this indicator here is going to evaluate to one for one of the terms when y is equal to yi let's say y, yi is one okay first component only the first term will be there every other term as you know is a number power to the power zero so it's one okay so it's gone okay uh, and uh, if you look at the log probability okay log p let's call this p 
simply. It's just a sum, right? Sum over uh, this indicator of y is equal to yi times uh, uh, log of uh, this this plus uh, log of this guy, which is I guess probability of y is equal to one. Let's call it uh, theta one. Okay, so we have theta one to theta k. Okay, this was the PMF, right? Um, remember in the in the slides there was a theta. Yeah, this theta. You know there is a bunch of so the theta vector is a has k components. So let's so log of theta one. Um, yeah, let's uh, theta one. Oh, y is equal to little y, sorry. Sorry, y is the running variable, so y is equal to little y. Um, uh, the sum is uh, y is equal to 1 to k. Okay. So this is the log, log of this probability, okay. This actually, so there's some parameters, right? Uh, I don't want to use theta. Okay, we've used theta. So basically the parameters were theta, uh, mu one to mu k, sigma one to sigma k, okay? Those are all the parameters of this joint distribution, right? Now, I wrote the log probability of this joint distribution, okay? Uh, this is nothing but, so if, you know, for the ith observation, so this P depends on, I guess, xi and yi. Sorry, y, xi and y. Anyway, so this thing, uh, this thing here, this probability is also called the likelihood. Likelihood is nothing but a conditional probability. I mean, in this case, there's no condition. So uh, likelihood is just the probability here. And the log of uh, likelihood is what I've written in the second line, okay? So this is the log of the likelihood. And uh, what you wanna do now is uh, maximize this over these parameters, okay? Find the best parameters that maximizes this likelihood. That's the maximum likelihood estimation problem, okay? So maximum likelihood estimation problem, I mean, the reason why I this, did this uh, very, I guess, uh, non-intuitive step is so that uh, the likelihood function uh, looks simple, okay? So this is just a likelihood function where there's a log of theta y, uh, but it only interacts with this data. So that, that term has nothing to do with any other parameter. Right, so theta one, let's say log of theta one, that has nothing to do with uh, any other parameter. Okay, so that there's a one, so terms decompose as additive terms where each term only depends on, uh, uh, doesn't depend on in a complicated way with other other variables, okay? So in, in that sense, it's easy to estimate uh, such things, okay? So in particular, if you wanna estimate theta hat one, it's just gonna be the number of, uh, you know, number of, okay, not number, let's say, it's just gonna be sum of, let's say they have n observations, so it's sum over one indicator of yi is equal to one, okay, that's it. It's just a count of number of guys who are, who had yi is equal to one, divided by total observations is an estimate for the theta, the first uh, component of my theta vector, okay, my data, uh, sorry, my parameter vector. Are people puzzled by why I wrote this or how I wrote this? It's just, uh, uh, so you can just take uh, the derivative. So, you know, you want to maximize this term, which I underline, okay? You want to maximize this. So the way you maximize the set, the derivative equal to zero, but there is a condition that, you know, some of the theta has to be equal to one, okay? So you just ensure that some of theta is equal to one while maximizing the theta. So you see that, and there's a log of theta. so you know that the derivative of a log of something is one by x, right? So you can see, you know, by imposing these constraints, you will see that the, this theta is equal to this, is what pops out, okay? I'll no, not do that computation uh, here. Uh, maybe if, if you want, I can clarify it in a break. Um, so anyway, for this joint distribution, if you had x's and y's, then the likelihood function is nice, okay? This log likelihood function is nice, and it's easy to figure out what the parameters are which is theta, all the components of thetas, mu one to mu k, sigma one to sigma k, okay? But 
what we only have is uh, just the x's. We don't have y's. Okay, y's were part of our model. We our data only had x's. Okay, it's a, like a two peak histogram type of thing, right? Uh, the reason uh, so we, we our data only has x's. Even if you assume this model, okay, which means that there were some y's, but y's are hidden as in not observed. Okay, so the same graphical model. Uh, where is this same graphical model as this? Okay, it's just that y is not observed, and you want to maximize the likelihood of the observed data. That problem turns out to be computationally messy. Okay, it's a it's a problem which involves all the variables uh, together. They all have to be maximized together. Okay, it's a computationally expensive problem. Is that something that you've not seen before? People have seen uh, EM before should understand why we are doing EM, right? So why we are doing EM is because if you want to maximize the likelihood of the data, okay, under this model, if you want to maximize the likelihood of only the data, which is Xs, right? In, unlike here, I'm trying to maximize the likelihood of both Xs and Ys, okay? If I only want to maximize the likelihood of Xs, that maximization problem is very messy in the sense of you, you won't have a nice uh, likelihood expression like this, okay? This is considered nice, and so you won't have a nice expression, and so that maximization problem is difficult. And uh, but that's what you care about, okay? You want, you care about the maximizing likelihood of the observed data. But it turns out that maximizing the likelihood of uh, this joint data, if you, you know, in a situation where, where you act as if you had observed the vice, is an easy problem, okay? And so there's a dis disconnect between these two, right? You care about maximizing the likelihood of the only observed data, you but you can solve the problem involving both data easily, okay? There's a disconnect. And so EM is an algorithm to fix this issue. And what it does is, in the E step, it uh, predicts these Ys, okay? It, ha it uh, kind of says, okay, uh, I'll, pr I'll make a prediction of what this Yi could be for each observation. So for each observation, what could be Yi? I can, you know, or the right way to say this is, I won't say exactly what Yi is equal to, I may have a distribution, okay, Y for observation Xi, Yi is equal to the first component is, you know, 30%, Yi is equal to the second component is 20%, and so on, okay? I'll, I'll do that, that's the E step. Once I get that, you know, some likelihood estimate of what Yi could be, now, now I have joint data, as in, now I have complete data, which means I have both Xs and Ys. In the M step, I just maximize this joint likelihood, which is what I wrote in the, in a, in a very scribbly fashion, right? In the M step, I'll maximize the joint likelihood, and that's, uh, that problem is easy relatively, okay? In the sense, we just saw how it is easy. I mean, for example, if you had if you had the yi's, then uh, the estimating theta is like just counter normalized. You know, how many points belong to the first component divided by all, all data, for example, okay? So that's the motivation for doing EM, okay? So EM still, so, uh, so EM is an algorithm to do maximum likelihood estimation if the original maximum likelihood estimation uh, is hard, okay? So EM is an iterative procedure. It uh, iterates estimates, by, by which I mean it starts with uh, uh, parameters theta, mu one to mu k, and uh, sigma one to sigma k. Starts with zeroth version of this, goes to the first version of this, and so on. So it kind of updates these parameters. To do these updates, okay, it's an iterative procedure, so it has to move, keep changing parameters to get to uh, the best set of parameters that maximizes your likelihood. Okay, okay, uh, but to maximize your observed data likelihood, it moves at, uh, moves across these parameters as it do, does the update. In each update, it does two steps: e step, where it fills in, given the current parameter estimates, it fills in what would be the likely value of y i's. Okay, and in the m step, it uh, finds the new parameters. Okay, finds the new parameters. Okay, that would be, uh, you know, theta mu one to mu k, same thing, sigma one to sigma k, new set of parameters. Okay, that's that's EM. Is the EM structure clear at least for those for those who have not seen EM? Maybe I'm talking very quickly, but people who have seen EM, they should uh, uh, or Gaussian mixture models, they should have no difficulty understanding what I'm saying. <laughs> Anybody has a question? Uh, yeah, so 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 basically, I want to maximize. Uh, 
so let us say log likelihood, so sum over i is equal to 1 to n log of the probability of xi, okay. We know what p of xi was, we, I just wrote the marginal, right, even assuming under this model. So I want to maximize this. So this has a bunch of parameters, theta, mu1 to mu k, sigma1 to sigma k, okay, right, these are all the parameters. I want to do this. I don't, I'm not going to, so I want, the way I'm going to do this, I can, uh, of course, directly try to uh, do some gradient descent on this, right, that is fine, that will not work. I mean, that will work, but, uh, you know, this this problem turns out that the objective function is, has hills and valleys, okay, so you will get into some, uh, you know, you're maximizing, so you'll get into top of some hill, but not the global, you know, globally optimum hill, but that's fine. Uh, EM is also like that, uh, in a sense, so EM also wants to do, do this objective, this is the objective, okay. This is our objective, fit the, get the best parameters. Now, what EM does is it knows that, you know, uh, so it has, uh, uh, so EM does is the following. Let's call this set of parameters um, alpha, okay? I'm just representing all these numbers that I need to estimate as alpha. Think of that as a vector or some, just concatenate everything and just call it a huge parameter, okay? Uh, let's call it alpha. So what EM does is, uh, jumps from alpha naught, start with some arbitrary bunch of numbers, go from alpha naught to alpha one to alpha two and so on, okay? It's an iterative algorithm. So I, I want to, just like gradient descent, you know, gradient descent goes from alpha naught to alpha one to alpha two, where it uses the gradient of the objective function, right? So here it does the same, uh, but with alpha naught, what it does is first figure out what would be the candidate, so it, it finds out probability of y for each observation, let's say the ith observation is equal to y, uh, given data, data is already there, so this is, uh, you know, x, x1 to xn is, let's call it data, given data, and alpha naught. So at alpha naught, I'm finding this conditional probability of what would have been yi, okay? Right, uh, this is the e step, okay? Once I know what is, what would be yi, okay? Just uh, intuitively think of, okay, maybe, yi for the ith observation is the third component, okay? Just, you know, it's not exactly, it's diffuse actually. It says third component with some probability, fourth component with some other probability and so on. But let's say it says for the ith, uh, ith observation, it's the third component, okay? So now, which means that you essentially now have, uh, e you know, essentially what you have is uh, xi comma yi data sets, okay? So this complete data is what you have because you just computed yi, probability of yi belonging to some component in the e step, right? So once you have this, you just do the MLE problem, which is max over alpha of sum over n, i is equal to one to n, of probability, you know, alpha is what you need to pick, of xi comma yi, okay? This problem I just said is uh, easy, okay? If you do this, you'll get uh, arg max of this is alpha one, okay? That's the M step. Okay, once you get alpha one, again, do the E step, get new re new estimates of where, uh, what could be yi, and get new estimates for uh, alpha and so on, okay? This is, this is the EM. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, yeah, basically, I mean, a very high level, you should know that compute expected values of doesn't have to be expected values. Uh, it could be just, I mean, if you know the conditional probability of this, then you know if you take an average, then you know what the expected value of yi is. So that's all it means. Um, of the unobserved variables, yi's are not observed, okay? And then you do the m step. So that's em. And uh, here are, I, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this was exactly what uh, we did. So um, p of mu i given xi is, is my, this is actually equal to probability of uh, yi is equal to one of the component, I guess the ith component, sorry, x, y, k, kth example. Uh, uh, the kth example is in the ith component given, uh, I guess in this case, given the x, k, okay? So this is nothing but, you know, which component does, does the i, kth example in this case, k is the index. So k the example belongs to, that's what we have done in the E step. And once we know these numbers, turns out that uh, this P of CEI is just theta i estimate, okay? Uh, which, you know, what is the proportion of component one, okay? What is the proportion of component two? What is the proportion of component k? 
is nothing but uh, running average of all the observations that I have. It's basically 1 by n uh, times the indicator of uh, number of guys. Instead of indicator, it's a soft end version of it, but indicator of whether uh, sum over, I guess, i of uh, whether yi is equal to, okay, I don't want to use i, okay, sum over k of yk is equal to i. The formula that I wrote in the, this, this, this formula here. That's this formula, and uh, means and variances are also can be easily computed. So what I'm saying is, in the M step, because of this Gaussian mixture assumption, and, and because of doing in the EM uh, in the M step, doing the maximization of the joint likelihood, uh, the estimation of parameters is like uh, simple. It's just a average and divide type of a estimation. You wouldn't have this if you were just maximizing the likelihood of the observed data. Okay. Now, of course, uh, the question arises: uh, Why? You know, I'm doing EM, which is doing something else, right? It's doing some estimating uh, unseen data and maximizing the total likelihood. Why would this actually maximize uh, this guy, okay? Which is maximize the original likelihood, right? Why would EM help me in maximizing my objective and getting the best parameters, okay? It's not clear. I mean, EM is doing uh, operating on uh, something else, whereas I care about this optimization problem, right? This objective, right? So, so in my class, I showed in the 575 class, we, sh we sh I don't know about some of you, but uh, we show that uh, uh, EM actually improves on the, so this is the, uh, so this term here is the partial likelihood, okay? This is called, I mean, not partial, this is called the marginal likelihood. Marginal because there are no YIs there, okay? So we, we can show that EM in every iteration uh, gets closer, get, improves on the marginal likelihood. So marginal likelihood. So you can keep track of. You can compute for alpha naught what would be the marginal likelihood. You can compute for alpha one what would be the marginal likelihood. We can show that marginal likelihood at alpha one is better than marginal likelihood at alpha naught, and marginal likelihood at alpha two is better than alpha like, marginal likelihood at alpha one. So you can show that there is improvement when you apply EM. Okay. We can't show that it maximizes. Uh, uh, it actually maximizes the original thing. Okay. Because the original thing is anyway non-convex, you won't get to the best hill on best, uh, I guess, top peak point, peak parameter setting. Uh, but EM at least shows that you make improvements in every iteration. So you, maybe you'll get to the local optima, some local hill, uh, but you will make progress. That's the idea. Okay. Any questions about EM and GMM? Oh, for those who have not seen it. No, EM will only get to local local optima here, local maxima. So it's not. Uh, I mean, the original problem is non-convex, as in uh, as I was saying. This this problem here, uh, this objective here, it will be some in the in the landscape of these parameters with too many parameters. You can't really draw it, but it's a messy optimization problem. So where you start from? Maybe you're starting from here. You may get to this hill, whereas the optima is over here. Okay. So EM also has the same issue. And EM is not the only way to get the parameters. There are other ways, okay? Uh, but EM is one way to do this optimization. Okay, so let's move to uh, next application, uh, which is LDA. So this is going to be a recap of LDA that I've already discussed five lectures ago or six lectures ago. Uh, so LDA is used for topic modeling. Uh, so how many of you actually? Uh, Worked with LDA modeling with some document corpus. It's one, two. Okay, you've used LDA or something else. I mean, given documents, you can do a hundred different things, right? You can do PFIDF. What is it? Okay, okay. Yeah. So, given a bunch of tweets, you know, kind of identify, essentially cluster. You know, it's unsupervised learning problem. Uh, so you can you can use this with varying amounts of success. Actually, I forgot to mention even GMMs are essentially clustering technique. It can be used for clustering, okay? In the sense that given data, fit a GMM. Once you fit the GMM, you have the means, right? Mu one, mu two, mu three, mu k, okay? Uh, now, if you want to cluster a new point, just look at its distance from any of these uh, means, okay? 
and uh, whichever mean is the closest, that's the cluster that the new point belongs to. Okay, so that's that's a very simple application of clustering a new point once you have built the GMM model. Okay, and uh, once you have mu one to mu case, you know exactly which cluster each point belongs to because for each point you can figure out which is which mu one or mu two or mu three vector it's close to, and whichever one it's close to, that's the cluster identity for that point. Okay, this is a clarification uh, if you didn't connect the dots about clustering and GMM. Okay, so LDA, I think uh, it's from 2003, maybe. Uh, so it's a, it's a way to do unsupervised learning, cluster a bunch of documents. And the idea is you assume, so you kind of uh, think of model how a, a document could have been generated. Okay. Now, in this model, there's not going to be any relationship between word orderings. Okay. It's a, it's a, in that way, it's un, in that sense, it's a bad model. You know, it's like a document is just a bag of words. There is no, you can reorder the words and it's the same document. Okay. Now, what is the generated procedure? First, you, um, okay, first you generate a topic, so you want to generate a document. Okay. First, you generate a topic uh, distribution. Okay. In this case, uh, there are t topic distributions. Okay. So, theta is, uh, theta has theta 1 all the way to theta t components and they sum to 1. Okay. It's a topic distribution. What proportion of topic does this document would have? Okay. Maybe 50% sports, 50% uh, you know, books, let's say, something like that, if, if t is 2. Okay. So first you generate that topic distribution for this document. Once you have this, then what you do is for each, so let's say I want to generate a document of length n, n words, n is equal to 100. So I want to generate 100 words. Then for each location, first word, second word, third word, fourth word, the words themselves I'm not going to specify yet, but for each position, I'm going to assign a topic to it. How do I assign it? I draw a sample from theta. Okay, draw a sample from theta, which tells me for each position, I'll, I mean for each position I'll draw a sample. So I'll draw, do hundred samplings. Okay, for each position it'll tell me which topic does that you know future word belong to. In the sense I haven't, I haven't told you what the word itself is, but I've told you or this position I'm going to use. Uh, one of the topics, okay. Maybe the first position is sports, second position is sports, third position is book, and so on. Okay. I mean, these positions actually don't matter, but this is just for like indexing. Okay, I want to generate 100, 100 word documents, so I'm just saying the first word, let me assign it to topic uh, sport, second word to sport, third word to bo book, and so on. Okay, so once I figure out what what's the topic of each word, then I just generate a word from the topic. Okay, so what is so for that, I actually need a uh, a topic, dist uh, what is it called? Yeah, a topic distribution. Uh, it's not topic distribution, sorry. Uh, it's called, uh, I guess it's also PMF. I, I don't think I've given a name for it. It's just a probability mass function over words. Okay, so beta, so, so there are T topics, right? So there's beta one all the way to beta T. Each one is a probability distribution, probability mass function, okay? So maybe there are like uh, seven words here. So each one is like a distribution, a probability mass function. Okay. So from this probability mass function, because I know which topic this you know ith word should belong to, from there I draw a sample of one of the words, and that's the word I put it in for that document for that location. Okay. So that's a generative process for how which I how by how I got the uh, got the uh, documents. Okay. Is there any question about the generative process? Okay. So once you have the generative process, then uh, now you need to do two. Th you can do two things. Uh, one is infer infer the topics of a new document okay that is just inference that would that you would do by um, not this slide but um, it's not this slide okay let's stick to the slide you can do two things one is inference which is that uh, given a document what what are the topic compositions uh, of this document okay that's uh, that's the inference problem which you can attack by knowing the techniques from last lecture. Okay, so you, last lecture was all about inference. Inference just means given evidence, given that uh, given that observed a bunch of words. Okay, figure out what is the topic distribution for this. So what, what is the probability of theta given uh, word one to word n? Okay, so these are observed now. Tell me what theta is. Okay, these are all random variables. 
So you can do you can compute this conditional probability. Okay, that's inference. So this is like figuring out the topic distribution of a new document. Second task you are you are supposed to do, I guess, uh, even before doing this, is to learn the parameters of this model. Okay, what are the parameters of this model? Uh, as you saw, this alpha, which is the parameter from which I could sample the topic distribution, is a parameter. Okay, it's a parameter of the Dirichlet distribution. Uh, also, this uh, beta. So there were t topics. So there are t beta vectors. You know, and beta vectors with coordinates they all sum to one. They are supposed to be probability mass functions, right? Probability mass functions. So finding alpha and beta is the estimation problem. Okay. Uh, and this is this is just a this is just a director probabilistic graphical model written in a plate type of a notation. So you could actually explicitly write, you know, like uh, theta giving uh, rise to you know, let's say the the word only has four four words, then you know z1, z2, z3, and z4, and then uh, from z you get uh, w1, w2, and so on. Okay, w3, w4. This is the you know expanded out uh, expanded out directed probabilistic graphical model, but uh, it's written in a plate notation. Okay, it's called plate notation. Any questions about LDA structure estimation? I, I haven't commented out commented yet. So estimation, it turns out that you could do something like EM, uh, but that's not enough. You also have to do some approximations. Okay, so uh, I mean, so basically, you want to find alpha hat and beta hats, right? So beta one to beta hat t. So this estimation, you could, you can use EM and you also need a few other tricks. Okay. Um, actually, this relates to this business of variational inference that we saw in variational order encoders. So uh, such tricks are also needed to learn these uh, parameters. Okay. So we'll not go into the details of that today. Um, any questions about LDA? No questions. Okay, I mean I'm giving you sufficient information so that hopefully I mean if you have to I mean you'll probably just use a package uh, to do LDA on on a corpus, but uh, you can also get into the internals given this background. So once you know the graphical model and what needs to be estimated, uh, uh, then it's a question of how do you come how do you get these estimates? You would do maximum likelihood estimation. It turns out that is messy, so you have to do em plus some few more tricks to uh, estimate these parameters okay similar to what we did in uh, gmms okay so next example is conditional random fields uh, so conditional random field is just a you know the undirected probabilistic graphical models are called uh, marco random fields okay mrfs so the conditional part is just saying some of the some of the variables are not going to be random; they are going to be fixed. Okay, so that's why it's a conditional random field. It's not going to specify how these conditioned random variables behave, as in the things which could have been random variables but are not. Okay, in this case, Xs, sorry, Xs are uh, things which could have been random variables in a in a different world or in a different model. Here they are not random variables, so we are not going to model them at all. So they are just evidence given. Okay. Uh, and then you're only modeling this conditional probability. Okay, that's why it's called a conditional random field. That's all. Uh, there's no other, um, ex, you know, reason. And uh, so, if you have such a model, such a, you know, if you, if you want to kind of model this, what does conditional random field do? Just like a Marco random field, or just like an undirected probabilistic graphical model, there'll be some normalization. Okay, it's basically one some normalization, which ensures that this is a probability distribution. And then it's a product of a bunch of uh, uh, terms uh, which involve like uh, like cliques, for example. Okay. Remember, there were potentials in the undirected graphical model case. It was just a product of cliques, or uh, product of uh, um, yeah, product of cliques typically, right? Uh, so here, think of I have uh, you know capital C potentials, and each potential function is written as uh, phi of C, phi subscript C. C is indexing which which potential function it is. Uh, and the interesting thing is both the potential function and the normalization now depend on x because uh, you know if if x was not there then this would have been the usual uh, undirected probabilistic graphical model uh, but x is there so it, this is not this is it depends on x the normalization depends on x okay uh, where normalization is nothing but uh, 
some or all assignments that uh, the random variable y can take of the sum of the numerator. Okay, and take the numerator, I sum it over all values that y can take. That's the denominator. Okay, so so that's it. That's the conditional random field description. But what's missing is like what is the what should be phi of phi function? Okay, what should be the phi function? Um, So in natural language processing, there is a particular preference for certain certain phi functions. Okay, uh, these phi functions, uh, you assume that phi uh, or this phi phi of c is actually e to the power um, w times f of c. Okay, so you just assume that okay, whatever this function is, it's an exponential function where there's going to be some parameter w and something which is not really uh, which doesn't which hopefully doesn't have a parameter. Okay, so the parameter is extracted out. It's like uh, you know this guy should have a parameter, right? So you know if if the whole thing is parametric, if this thing has a parameters, then the only place where it can have parameters is in this phi function, right? All I'm saying is that phi function's parameter is just going to be w, nothing else, okay? And uh, uh, in fact, there will be a specific functional form which is e to the power w times some other quantity, but the other quantity hopefully is not parametric. Think of that thing as a, like an indicator function, okay? It's just Indicator of uh, something happened. Maybe in XC uh, something happened, or in YC something happened. So let me give you an example. Okay. So think of uh, let's say we are doing uh, uh, ent entity uh, tagging. Okay. So this is yeah. So let's say we are doing entity tagging in a, in, a, in as a natural language processing task, by which I just mean given a sentence. Tell me which is a which is a which which entity is is a word. So if a word is an entity, what type of entity is it? Okay. So what is an entity? So let's look at this sentence. This is just an example. Okay, not much details, but uh, let's look at this sentence. Then Mrs. Green is a person. Okay. Uh, this is also a person. Finance committee, I guess, is a committee uh, location, New York. Okay. So these are entities in this sentence. Okay. So you want to figure out entities in the sentence. You should not find the entity on a word by word basis independent of other words. Given the whole sentence, you can figure out what the entity is. For example, you can disaggregate. So you can figure out that you know previously there was an entity called a uh, person entity called green, um, you know green. And so if you encounter another word green, maybe that's not the color but the uh, but the person. Okay, so there's a relationship. Uh, so these. These words, Mrs. Green spoke today in New York. Uh, those words will be your Xs. So your whole sentence, in this case, two sentences, that will be your Xi. X, Xi corresponds to the first word, second word, third word uh, for each I. Okay. So that's your Xi. Given the se sentence or these two pairs of sentences, now you're trying to find Yis. Okay. Which are, if it is an entity, tag it as an entity of certain type. Okay. Like person, location, or whatever. Okay. And uh, and what would the, what would be this function like f f function b for example uh, if you want to so y c is what you want to trying to figure out what is entity so you can ask whether you know were the you know were were there two similar words uh, in 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 this in some in in the past you know this word plus or minus five words and this word plus or minus five words so you can have a graph where you can say when I'm trying to figure out the entity for a certain word I can also look at what were the other words and what were their entities as well? Like I can jointly assign the entities. Okay, so that's the graphical relationship here. Yeah. Uh, is it that entity I can identify? Yeah, entity tagging identification same thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is identifying entities in in the sentence. Yes. Then I thought it was an entity. Tagging was done with. And you can have many different models for the same task. Yeah. I mean, that should be clear, right? I mean, you can use for time series methods, you can use RNNs, you can use uh, Arima, you know, all those things. You can use supervised learning. So, similarly, entity tagging you can achieve using multiple techniques. Yeah. Like even language models, we saw we could use RNNs, we can use Marco models, right? So. I mean, Marco models are essentially like the ones we saw hidden Marco models. But, um, so, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details here because it's 
quite devoid of details. So, I mean, there's some details here. Uh, Yeah, I mean, so basically, I, I don't want to spend time on the, okay, it doesn't zoom in, it does. Okay, so I just want to show you the graph. I mean, let's not go into the details of what the nodes are. So the observed nodes are, are the ones at the bottom and uh, the potential functions are gonna be um, things which involve, yeah, these, these functions, fees, okay, uh, which are given here, like for example, uh, fee, Two, I mean, so of y t and t prime is for all pairs uh, t and t prime such that uh, the words are the same. For example, okay, um, because if a word appears in the, in the same, you know, appears twice, then it's likely to be the same entity. So these are feature in, you know, these are uh, handcrafted features. So this f c function here, so it is like uh, an indicator of whether there were two words which were the same. Okay. W is the weights that we're going to learn. That's all. That's 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 the uh, that's the estimation problem for C uh, conditional random fields. You want to estimate Ws. FCs are some hand-designed uh, feature, uh, hand-designed feature functions or hand-designed parts of these potential functions. Okay, those are just uh, handcrafted, and uh, given them, you're just trying to find Ws. Okay, and uh, uh, this is this is the graph relationship between the entities that you want to tag, like. Uh, all these things which are not known, so you want to find out what this, what these labels are, what these uh, entity values are, okay? Uh, and uh, given given the two sentences, so that's that's the inference problem. If you know the parameters, if you don't know the parameters, you need to estimate. Estimating Ws is the is the subject of the last part of this lecture. Okay. Any questions? So don't worry. I mean, so just uh, this graph should be fine, right? So it's an undirected graphical model. You you haven't observed the top play, top guys, which are the entity values themselves, whether it has an entity and not, and the bottom guys are the sentence, the words themselves. Okay. Uh, any questions so far for these three four applications that we saw? Okay, so what we'll do next. Uh, Um, is okay for the next part of the lecture. What we're going to look at is uh, different estimation problems, okay, and uh, which means that we'll revisit the EM at some point of time, but we'll also revisit uh, maximum likelihood estimation, okay. And uh, before we take a break, I just wanted to show you what all different types of problems we can have, right? So you could have directed or undirected graphs. So that CRF is undirected here. This is a hidden Markov model or a Gaussian mixture model. Or LDA, is all the same. Uh, you could have complete data. So if you don't have complete data where the yi's were missing, so you would do EM, right? Uh, you could have incomplete data. Uh, you you may know the graph. You may not know the graph. You may know, just know. So somebody just gave you an Excel sheet with just the uh, columns. You don't know what graph it corresponds to. Okay. So then the problem is how do you even estimate the graph first? Okay. Maybe I want to estimate the graph first. Then estimate the parameters and then do inference. Okay, so there is a few steps involved, and uh, the last part is just a question of whether whether you're estimating the joint distribution itself or you care about just uh, predicting. Okay, so this part is not very critical, but uh, these are the different variations that you can have. Okay, and we'll look at uh, some subsets of these variations as examples in the next uh, part of this lecture. Okay, is a is a is this slide clear? All I'm saying is, for example, you could have a directed graph. You may you may have full data, and you may know the graph. Now tell me what the parameters are. Okay, that's one example of a question. Right? You could have a directed graph. You may have incomplete data, and uh, and you may know the graph. And now I'm asking what the what the parameters are. That's the that's the hidden Marco or the uh, LDA or even GMM. They're all the same category. I mean, if you have complete data, it's an easy problem, okay? As you'll see, it's a simple maximum likelihood estimation problem. It's easy. Um, but if you don't have complete data, it'll, it'll be a little bit messy. Anyway, that's that's the set of problems that we'll look at. A few examples of these. Uh, we'll pick and choose from this uh, table, and we'll look at a few, few problems, okay? Okay, let's take a break for uh, seven minutes and come back. 